All right. How's everybody doing today? Not too many people tuned in just yet, but as soon as some people are tuned in, we'll go ahead and jump right in. Um, some random topics today is the idea. Let's see. Make sure I'm in the right spots. I am certainly on YouTube. Pardon me, turning my head here. Um, here's put that down there. This would be like uh, sort of my gosh, I have my control panel down here and then my screen that I'm looking at up there. That I'm nope, didn't want to do that. Did not want to do that. Let's see. What I wanted to do was that. Yeah, that's better. Okay. Today, I see him. Which way? Which camera am I? Too many things. I'm too confused. All right. So, as you probably noticed, as we get towards the end of the semester, uh, I'm kind of just throwing some random topics and things out there. We've really kind of covered most of the things. Uh, in terms of the structure of a lot of things about the C-sharp programming language. Hopefully you're all feeling fairly comfortable with the kind of Unity uh, engine in general. Uh, we introduced a bunch of new concepts this semester that we didn't, we don't normally, or hadn't normally covered in a lot of the, the previous years, like the Bolt engine or the Bolt scripting language, because now that's available. And hopefully uh, people will take advantage of that, especially into Game Dev 1 for those people who aren't necessarily programmers by training. So um, from here on out, I'm going to like kind of bounce back and forth a little bit between Bolt and a little bit between C Sharp, because I know some of you have expressed an interest in, in kind of uh, getting more comfortable with Bolt. And so I'm showing a couple of different concepts and showing a couple of different things. I put up some tutorials, and um, if you want to use them, use things like this in your, uh, in your final project, by all means, please do. Uh, because we do, are, I, I am definitely looking for things like using scripted camera motion, not just the simple camera motion where, you know, it's just following your player, for example, um, and other, you know, now we like incorporate things like, you know, the uh, inheritance. So you have different types of enemies that are inheriting from one common class and they vary and they don't have to vary like by a tremendous number of different things. Maybe they just vary a little bit. Um, you know, they have that one additional attack or that one additional behavior or, you know, something like that. They can build on one another. Like if you've noticed um, in my game here, in my Coingen game, uh, one of the big things that I did is my sort of my, uh, I don't know what state it's in right now. We'll see where it's at. Um, where, let's see, wander around here. And this is getting a little bit, a little bit more advanced here, certainly. Um, with regards to playing with lighting and 2D lights and all that kind of stuff. Um, but the cool thing that um, the inheritance shows in my game is that this, uh, the use of, and boy, the lights are really kind of down low in this. Uh, let's see, how do I, is it the tab key? Oh, there we go. <laughs> um, so there's inheritance used in two different ways in here. One being that I can get new weapon types uh, that inherit from a base weapon class. So the weapons always have this sort of um, aim and shoot sort of thing. And then on top of that, I layer on these sort of, sort of multiple um, potential attack type kind of things where it's like at four points or at eight points. And that's, you know, that's using a base weapon and then having weapon two and weapon three, where they could be called weapon four, weapon eight. Um, and then I also have uh, different types of enemies that, that have sort of different behaviors. So their update routines are slightly different. Some of them have, um, you know, oh, I didn't mean to do that. Um, some of them will follow, some of them have their rotator around and so on. But they generally, you know, what I do is I try to have them inherit from a common class that kind of establishes their main behavior or their tracking behavior. And then what they do, whether or not they can fire at the player, or, uh, how easily they track the player, how do they see the player, for example, how aggressive are they? All right. So that's the sort of thing I'm looking for 
um, in you know kind of using the inheritance. Now, also one of the things I've been asking to see is some some good use of like coroutines because this is a really good example of basically of uh, multitasking, and that's going to be again that's kind of a common thing that's going to be useful no matter what type of programming you're doing. You know, in computer science, if you're doing, it could be anything from server applications to games and so on. Thinking about, okay, I have multiple things going on. How do I divide up tasks in such a way that this can run while this is running, for example? You know, certain things that take longer, certain things that, uh, you know, kind of happen in the background. Like, for example, there's some glowing uh, things that go on with some of my characters here right now. Let me show you some other behaviors. Um, so, for example, there's when this, when this guy bumps into or, or uh, has somebody that he can have sort of an interaction with. Uh, like this squirrel, for example, there's this uh, kind of dissolve effect. And even when, like, basically anything he can run into causes that sort of dissolve effect. And let's see, cause again, like here, sort of disappears and then reappears with that kind of dissolve. And that's done through a coroutine, right? Because I wouldn't want to like really change how the main loop or the update gets done because it might take long to slow down the interaction in the game that way. I really want to have that sort of as a separate task so that if it takes longer, if it takes shorter, it's going to interrupt the gameplay and suddenly like increase lag and things like that. So like in my case, if I look at the hero, um, we'll see that the hero has some different, let's see, I think that particular one is in the hero's script. And where is that? Okay, here we go. So there's this glow, uh, which is a coroutine, right? So that it will fade from some value of zero, well, yeah, from, from zero to one, right? And it will just do that as a coroutine in the background, in the side, so I don't have to worry about exactly what's going on, right? And this is actually, we haven't really talked about this in here, because materials and shaders is a more advanced topic. Um, so I don't know if we have, well, maybe, maybe we can introduce that for those of you. Uh, give me a thumbs up, react, comment, ask, and so on. I won't make it a requirement, but certainly um, to do shaders, it's, it's a bunch of things. You have to adopt the universal render pipeline and then start, you know, adding a whole, you know, 2D renderer to your game and so on. Not normally the intro topic, but if you're interested, we can do that. So here I am doing a fade and you'll see the cool thing is that, yes, what happens, the player first joins the game, it starts a code routine with that my glow. And this just runs through, it takes one second to run. Why does it do that? Well, because it counts up and it waits 0.05 seconds in between each one. And each time it adds 0.05, and then when it hits one, it's done, right? So this is a little coroutine that takes one second. And every 0.05 seconds, so 20 times, it's gonna update this fade uh, material property, right? And you could do anything. You could be changing the alpha value and so on. This one's doing something a little bit more, a little fancier which is uh, actually interacting with this glow shader, which is, uh, let's see. Oh, hopefully it didn't crash Unity Light. Okay, which is using this glow shader here, um, which I created to kind of, you know, do some different things. Um, kind of creates this disturbance and fades in and kind of sort of animates that weird um, behavior on the, uh, on the player there. So something you can kind of, these all things build, right? So mastering coroutines, mastering interactions, that's going to build on that. You're going to wind up using that, you know, the same techniques. You're going to work on the other ones. All right. So coroutines, inheritance, uh, interpolation. I didn't see a lot of people using interpolation on the last project too much. So I wanted to show you an example of that. Um, and also the, the notion of some camera motion. All right, so, and this is a work in progress here, but I wanted to talk about, and, and I think, yeah, I did put this up as a separate tutorial in Bolt, but the concepts are the same whether you're using Bolt or you're using um, 
C sharp. So it's just a matter of, you know, hopefully uh, those of you who are more advanced used to programming, you can adopt these things into your C sharp. That'd be a good challenge. Look at the bolt code and see, okay, how would I do that in C sharp? But the basic idea is that I have the player here and the player is just this little wheel for some reason. I just said the player would be the wheel and there is camera motion that is based on the player's position. You'll see it's kind of moving around here a little bit. Um, so as the player moves, the camera will move with the player, right? And it's not a one-to-one -one sort of thing. It is definitely an eased sort of thing. And you'll notice it doesn't go out of bounds. It's not perfect yet. This is... Uh, like I said, definitely a work in progress. And um, you'll notice I never get outside of this. Uh, I shouldn't get outside of this border here. Uh, this one's a little bit wonky here. I guess I'm sort of outside the border there. Um, yeah, the player's allowed to move outside, but the camera shouldn't be. Yeah, all right, there's a bug. I think if I move over, and then I move back in again, it'll do the right thing. Yeah, so colliding regions. If you're more interested, if you're interested in that, definitely check out the other tutorial. But the um, important part here is this use of interpolation to figure out, okay, where should I move the camera to? It's not just following one to one, right? And it's really, really simple in that there is a, in this case, it is not a, uh, it is not a script, it's actually a bolt a graph, but you certainly could do this in a script as well. And it is here on the camera. The camera has a behavior, so you can put a camera, a script on your camera. And maybe I'll go ahead and um, I'll go ahead and I'm going to do it as a C sharp version, right? Just to just to uh, prove that that's possible. Okay, so here's the flow machine that is the camera follower. And I'm going to go ahead and turn that off. So now what should happen is our camera will no longer move. All right, all right. So the player will just happily move off the screen. Right. The camera is planted. So the simplest thing to do in a script would be, of course, okay, we have camera, we're gonna attach a component, and we're gonna call it camera tracking. Okay, that'll be our, our new script called camera tracking. And the simplest thing to do, of course, in that camera tracking, is that happening down here? Uh, no. All right, we'll do it here. And I'll pull that one up. Okay, so camera tracking, what do we want to do? Well, the simplest thing to do, of course, would just be to say uh, transform dot position. Now, this is the camera that I'm on here, right? Is uh, well, let's do it this way. Let's let's make it so that there is a targeted object. I right? want to move the camera to focus on a specific object, and normally that target will be the player, right? Seems like the obvious thing to do. Um, so game object target. And we will make that a public game object so we can set it in the um, in the editor. So we will call that target dot well uh, target. That's not right. Target dot transform dot position, All right? This is about the simplest sort of tracking you can do. All right, now I could even say if target not equal null. Now this, I'm gonna recommend you do more of this sort of thing, All right. Now normally you would just go ahead and do that and assume that someone set that up right. Right, but here is some, this is defensive programming now. This is saying, okay, maybe this is being used and somebody else hasn't set it up or I forgot to set it up, whatever. So if I save this and 
I play the game, you'll notice here in my main camera, I haven't set that game object. So at least I shouldn't, I hope I don't. I did this right. My console, and that's a bolt error. There's some bolt things going on here. Let's clear that. You'll notice I'm not getting an error, right? Because I took the time to check that, right? Better would be that I have some kind of print there. So here's some defensive programming, All right? Let's do that. Let's uh, do this a little bit more. So let's go back to our camera tracking and say else. Or I could even say, I don't want to get into try and throws and catches and so on, uh, to say, uh, I'll leave that in here. Else, debug dot log, and we'll call it a warning. And we'll say, forgot to set the uh, target. We're doing defensive programming here. So if somebody else is using our code, it's not going to crash. And we will be warning them in here. Clear that. Yeah. <laughs> Bolts definitely leave some weird stuff around. And you'll see, ah, OK, forgot to set the camera target. Forgot to set the camera target. All right? So let's come back. And now we can just leave that in place, go to the hierarchy and say, all right, all right, all right, let's set the camera target. Main camera, uh, there's the object, and I want to set it to the player. All right, so now I'll no longer get that bug, that error, that warning. I shouldn't. And something happened. What happened? Well, the camera is moving. The camera is certainly moving. But the problem is that the camera is now, can anyone, I should, I should wait. Anyone, I'm going to let you pop out. Whoops, that was not what I wanted to do. Um, oh boy, now I've done it. Anyone has hazard a guess? Does anyone want to guess why this is not working? All right, go ahead in the, uh, or why it, is not quite working. All right. It's clipping into the player. Sort of, yes. And, and can you be more specific? What's, uh, what would I do to fix this? All right. So by clipping, let's say, here's the main camera. And normally, the main camera is here. All right, with somebody talking, you do that. Pull the camera back, exactly, that's right. What we need to do is we need to get the camera, it should be at minus 10, and the problem is it definitely does. It moves towards the player, winds up being in the same plane, and gets stuck there. All right, so the first thing we normally do, we'll go to camera tracking, and we need to make sure, so this is why I usually do something like this. I have you know, a little bit more, a little bit fancier here. Um, Vector three. Target, what we'll call it, uh, camera target equals, uh, and we'll just leave that. Huh. Target, wow, lowercase equals, well, in this case, we're going to start off saying um, this. This is kind of the target, right? But it's not quite right, because what we want to do is say camera target 
dot z, that's the problem, equals um, transform dot position dot z. Now you notice I'm not just setting it to minus 10 because I don't like to assume that maybe someone's going to come and change that camera position again, right? So I'm going to use what it's set to in the player, right? Um, so we're going to use that. And now we're going to say camera target. Okay. So hopefully I hit save. And lo and behold, now we move around. I put the stones there just so we can kind of see them. Now the player will wander off the edge of the screen for eternity there. I thought one thing you could do, well, if you didn't want to bounds, you don't want to bound the camera. Well, I don't get ahead. Sorry, I was getting ahead. All right. First thing first. All right, now it literally tracks it, just per perfectly tracks it along, which is uh, one way of doing it. But as I was doing it the other one, what I did and what I recommend is that the camera tracking, instead of directly targeting that position or directly setting it here, a better thing would be to say camera target Again, camera target equals math, and I'll say vector three dot lerp. All right, now I'm going to interpolate between two positions. All right now, obviously, this is the position that the camera is currently at. Right, that's the camera's current position. And then we have the target, which is where we want the camera to be pointing. And then we want to give it some uh, interpolation, float t, right? Some amount between the two points, right? This is our mix. Remember, it's zero to one. So what I usually like to do, I use, you know, my rule of thumb is just say 0.1. So move 10% of the way closer, right? And I don't have to worry about, you know, if I sit still, if I take, call this long enough, it will move to an infinitesimally, never get to that position because it's always interpreting a little bit more. This is the Zeno's paradox issue, right? We're always getting closer and closer and closer. For all practical purposes, we get there. We're within 0.001, you know, tiny, tiny amount. Um, but the nice thing is that this now, it will give us this sort of nice, smooth camera motion. If, if the uh, player moves by a lot, for example, or even like the first time, you'll see they'll sort of snap into the center of the, of the screen. Instead of just snapping, it will interpolate its way in, right? Yeah. All right. So you'll see if I stop. So I have a smoothed motion now. Which is nice. It creates a, uh, a nicer feeling. Now what I can also do, because now the camera is sort of continuously moving. And another option is to say, well, I only want the camera to move if the player has moved by a certain amount, right? So there's another camera movement technique. And let's see if I can pull this one off. Let's see, which way am I going there? <laughs> All right, let's see if I can remember. So instead of just immediately doing this, we would say something like, if, let's see. Um, Well, we're figuring out here, here's the target. And 
and here's the camera position. So what we want to do is if the distance between those two is larger than a certain amount, then move, right? So I could say if uh, vector, no, yeah. Distance, and I'm going to give it two vectors. The two vectors are going to be camera target and transform.position. And it's going to say if that is greater than three. and move the camera. Whoops. Uh, auto completes that for me and it's not quite right. There. All right. Now, whether or not we did this interpolation, we can do it inside or outside. I think it would, it would uh, be okay in either, yeah, either case, but we're gonna be using this uh, just to figure out, should we move towards, All right? So let's give it a try now. Hit play. And all right. So the moment we move outside, a little bit jerky here. I'm not sure if that's my. No, that's not my. Uh, that's my algorithm. It's not my. <laughs> it's not my. Uh, screen capture. So anyone, I, I know why it's doing that. Anyone want to hesitate? Anyone want to guess what the issue is there? No guesses? Feel free to turn your microphone on and guess. Everyone should just have their microphones on. To, I don't know. Maybe they should. So my house is kind of loud. Okay, that's fine. So what's happening is it's waiting for that distance to become greater than that and immediately putting it towards there, right? It's using that as the new position. Um, and it is moving it 10% of the way there. Um, I wonder if I, let's see, let's try that without the interpolation. And we'll see what the effect is there. Yeah, that's going to be weird as well. Because as I basically say, if, if you've gotten that, that 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 far out, it's going to move by. Yeah, that's even worse, right? That's moving by the three. OK, so what we did is we basically said we the point one value is too high, right? Now it moves all the way. And you'll see it's kind of tracking in these large jumps, jumps by three by three, by three, by three. That's no good, all right? So here, we have a much, much smaller increment. Now, point 0.1 is a lot. So let's assume point, uh, oh, 0.02, right? So this would be the equivalent of a, what, 50th of a second. Right? Move as much as you would towards that in a 50th of a second. So that should be, that should look pretty smooth. 50 frames per second sort of thing. Oops. Okay, so now the camera motion is decent. Now I think it is just the kind of lagginess of my computer. But you'll see, basically, is trying to keep the player relatively centered in the screen. But it's not always motion moving. Like if I keep them there just moving in the center, you'll notice the camera's not moving at all. It waits until they're trying to get outside of that. 
right? So they'll never get off the screen. But also the camera isn't continuously moving. All right, that's a fun one. All right, now, so that's, that's another example. Um, in the Bolt, I'm gonna to refer, the Bolt one does a bunch of different things uh, with regards to setting up some bounding boxes so that the camera motion will actually look at bounds and say, okay, I can't move the camera outside of certain bounds, which is kind of a cool effect as well, right? This way, imagine, you know, you don't wanna move outside of this area, right? You wanna keep the camera, because this is your stage here in here, right? Um, so this way you don't have to have an infinite world around you, you kind of force. But I thought here'd be kind of a cool thing. What if you wanted to generate the world so that you could have an infinite world? We haven't talked much about generating levels on the fly, other than obviously you all know how to do the, um, uh, how to instantiate objects, right? So you could, just like we randomly populate uh, NPCs and other sorts of things throughout, you could build, procedurally build levels, right? So I encourage you to try that. I have some items within your game that are procedurally generated. You've, the vast majority of you have done it for NPCs, like I said, but, you know, NPCs and, and power-ups and things. But think about, you know, could you come up with an algorithm that would, you know, there are maze generation, generating algorithms out there, things like that. Um, you could design, you know, sort of random population of maps. You could sketch out the maze and then let it generate random stuff on top. And that's fine with regards to placing objects using prefabs and things. But what if you wanted to actually create tile maps on the fly, right? We want to use, like using tile maps because they're very, very efficient because basically you don't have an, a separate object for every spot on the screen. You just have a reference to a tile map at that location. Just boom, just works. So uh, here's an example of something. Now imagine, and this is the simplest version because I wanted it to, to be simple. So the player here, I'm going to turn on my tile trail and tile trail is not working. Um, what did I do wrong? Let's double check here. My tile funks script and tile trail public bool tile trail false if tile trail when I break it. Let's turn that part off. Trivial that that shouldn't have broken anything. Um, maybe we'll fix it on the fly if this doesn't work. Not generating my tile trail. Um, I was sure it's not enabled right now. Uh, yeah, that one, that, that shouldn't even, I, I disabled that in the code, <laughs> that part. So what's supposed to happen? Let's see <laughs> what's supposed to happen. And I swore it happened before. Um, so this is a simple function in here where we have basically a reference to a tile map, which looks like it's set up correctly. Here's my tile map. Let's see. Yeah, the tile map object, and here is a tile. Uh, you know what? Let's make sure we have a valid tile. That might not be a valid tile. Um, all right. These are tile assets here. Let's see. Maybe that's what I did. I'm going to grab. Oops. <laughs> Player, grab this and put that one there. And that is not the problem. Interesting. 
Oh, how disappointing. Uh, it's a pretty simple, pretty simple function. And the idea is inside the update, you can get a reference to a tile map. And then it says, OK, get the tile position based on the position. Or, or yeah, you, you have to get a cell position for tiles, right? Tiles aren't at normal world coordinate systems, right? Uh, world coordinate component. World coordinates. There we go. Um, so you have to figure out, OK, based on the position that you're at, which in this case was going to be supposed to be the player's position, um, it would say, all right, looking at that particular tile map, get the tile at that location. And if it's null, then use set tile to place that tile that we referenced up here, you know, a reference to that at that position. Um, Take the simplest version of it here with no condition whatsoever. And let's see if that works. Uh, I'm not convinced that's going to work. But if it does, that's going to be interesting. No. All right. Well, let's see. Time to, time to enable some debugging here. All right. Uh, where are we? There. So let's put the debugger. All right, that's definitely happening. Transform position is certainly valid. Tile A is referring to that tile. Hmm. That seems pretty legit. Unless, um, no, ah, ah, OK. You'll notice I am now erasing tiles. All right. So. I'm not using the right asset there. So let's try that. This, this particular, should I be using? Let's see. Let's try to reference to one of the tiles in here. I have two sets of tiles in there. That Maybe that's my problem. Um, it's because I imported twice. So let's put that there. Different reference. No. Why? I'm not getting a good reference to a tile now. Missing sprite. Well, that's not good. So don't use those. That says missing sprite as well. Hmm. Something. Something broke something. OK. Those tiles are valid. <laughs> OK. Let's use one of these that ha is not missing a sprite. I bet that's going to work. All right. There we go. I don't know why. The Unity editor was all weird on me, but if you have correctly set up your tiles and they are not null, we can basically, if you wanted to build a level editor, for example, these are ways to do it. You can effectively 
paint in stuff into the game here. Now, let's take a look. Uh, one thing I'm not sure of that I'm very curious about is what happens if we add a component here to this tile map that we want to add a, a tile map collider. So you'll notice that we do have, now the player will bump into those. Let's see what happens. Will they automatically get added to the tile map collider? And it looks like they do, which is interesting because now the player could box itself into a corner if we wanted. So if you wanted to, how many of you are familiar with uh, two games, two possible games, Dig Dug, has anyone played Dig Dug? Dig Dug is a fantastic game back from the 70s. Um, I, I, I hesitate to tell you how many, how much uh, Dig Dug I've played. Um, but effectively you could do things. You could have, you know, fill this all in with dirt and then remove tiles as you go, right? Um, or how many of you played the light cycles in Tron? Right, everybody remember the original Tron arcade game? Oh, these are other classics, right? The idea was basically, if you've seen Tron Resurrected, no, Tron Rebooted, Tron Derez, Tron Legacy. There we go, one of those. Um, <laughs> the idea with the light cycles is that uh, as you move, you leave this trail that other things could potentially bump into and they will be destroyed if they bump into the trail. So you can kind of block them out. So you can create this maze that they have to get through or if they run into their, their block and die. So you can do similar things by kind of painting in objects on the fly. And I find that the tile map, when it is working correctly, uh, is a pretty compelling way to do that because it's very, very, very simple. All you're doing is placing a tile where you are. Now, this would probably benefit from... Um, a little bit of logic around this to say, because you'll notice it's placing the tile at the corner uh, or the nearest, you know, it's just kind of figuring out, you know, where and the, the motion of the player is not clipped at all. You know, it's not on a grid. So it might be that uh, if you're at an angle here, you should be drawing multiple ones or, you know, you fill in extra. So here's an idea for your game. Imagine you can have these special power-ups where if you get that power-up, you're allowed to paint in new platformers, platforms, right? So if you had some kind of you know, thing in the game where, okay, the player, there's a gap the player cannot cross, the player has to find the right article to actually go and build in uh, extra things on the map, okay? So... Like I said, um, well, this is a new, the, the, the tile map addition thing I have, we hadn't showed before. So yeah, that's, that's a new technique. Um, but a lot of these are, you know, kind of, you know, you're gonna find certainly in game development, everything changes so fast. There's no way I can cover everything in one course. There's no way anyone can cover everything in one course. So you're gonna have to, you know, go out and find new things. Show the topics as we've covered in the class and build, you know, the core things are gonna be there. The core things about like, you know, how we do inheritance and use the interpolation and use coroutines that's going to be over and over and over again but then additional features whether you're using them with shaders or you're using them with path planning or you're using them with whatever that you're going to build on from there so in your final project make sure that uh, and i'll post again we're going to have sort of a, a a list a laundry list of the class and what i'm want you to do is, is uh, as part of your submission, you're basically going to say, okay, of this list, where have you implemented it that you feel is a good demonstration? Now, if you did it in a previous game, you said, okay, coroutines, I use this in project three to do this. Okay, done. I used interpolation to do this. I used tile maps to do this. You know, so uh, I used animation. I used an effector, I used, you know, um, those sorts of things. So there is going to be a component of the final submission that is going to be your way to say, okay, let's look back at everything we've done in the semester and say, okay, have you covered them? And the good news is if there's something that you missed in a previous project, 
potentially you can kind of say, okay, if your final project touches on everything, you can kind of make up for make up a few points here and there. Okay, so that's one of the parts of the final submission that's different than the others. I really am going to have that, that sort of checklist. And the other piece is, if you haven't already seen the video, there's a video up in, in the playlist that shows how to create a WebGL build of your game and how to put it up on itch.io, right? Um, whether it's your complete game or not, that's okay. If you want to just put certain levels, you can do that because you can include certain you know, certain scenes in your build and so on. You can kind of customize things. Not everything in your project has to wind up. You can build, you know, from there. Um, but I will be looking for some submission on itch.io of your kind of released game, right? So there is a release part here. It doesn't have to be your final build, your final game even, but there's gonna be some version up there. I hope it is your final version. That makes my life that much easier. And as you've probably noticed by now, the more obvious you are, the more uh, easy you are for me to recognize what you've done, the more I can just kind of go get through the grading quickly, as opposed to, you know, the more hidden things I have to dig, 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 then the more I start to look for things. This is a typical inspector problem. Um, the harder you make someone look for something, the more they're going to try to find issues, right? Classic building inspector problem. So always try to like create a good overall impression. And then all the little details and things, well, you know, we, we get into those uh, as needed. All right. So that's it for today. That's about, you know, a good one hour's worth. Mostly inspirational stuff. Uh, and also hopefully get, get the juices, creative juices flowing on some ways to, you know, do some something to kind of separate your game from the typical, you know, what might be. There's lots and lots of tutorials out there that's going to show, yeah, this is the typical platformer. I move, I jump, I whatever. There's spikes that you fall into, right? Do something in your game to kind of stand out from the typical tutorial platformer, right? Whether that's, you know, really interesting kind of traps, you know, using tile map, you know, editing tile maps on the fly, having some kind of cool camera motion approaches to it. And it could be kind of mix and match. You see a bunch of different techniques, but, you know, try to make there something about your game that, that sort of makes it stand out beyond the typical, yeah, I thought a bunch of tutorials sort of uh, approach. All right. Um, not a lot of comments up on the, um, on Discord, so, and not too many people. Well, okay, you know, a couple of people here today. Um, so we'll probably call it at that as far as the official lecture portion of things go. As I add new things, I will continue to add them to the playlist. So always keep, you should have a reference to that YouTube playlist. Um, always kind of go back to that one because I'm just, you know, there's tons and tons of stuff in there. I'm, adding things to it. Um, okay. On that note, have a great weekend. Is it Thursday? Today is Thursday, isn't it? I get so confused now. Um, hopefully uh, you're not stressing about all kinds of other things. Have a good weekend. Try to relax. Get a little, you know, bit. Um, think about design before you dive too much of this. I've been talking to some people, you know, kind of excited about a certain feature, but that feature is not core to the gameplay and core to the whole thing. So don't get caught up in some detail that's only going to be 10% of your game and you wind up missing the 90%. Be careful of that as you go. So big chunk of time over the weekend. Have a good weekend. Try to get a bunch of stuff done. Um, be safe. Be well. Stay out of the storms. Stay away from COVID-19. I have to stop. I have to press buttons to stop streaming everywhere.